me in your Bibles here. We are going to continue our series on uh, lightening your load. And uh, we're going to be heading to Proverbs chapter number two. Proverbs chapter number two is where we will head and uh, spend a little bit of time thinking and imagining a little bit on what does it mean for us as people of God if we are talking about lightening our load, how many of you know sometimes it is uh, an important uh, discipline for us to learn how to listen more than we talk? Oh, Jesus. How many know sometimes it's very hard to listen? And not only just listen, but how many of you know sometimes you got to listen to wisdom? Mm-hmm. So let's take a look here and see what the scriptures teach us this morning, particularly given all the many significant challenges that we as uh, people living in a fallen world continue to be mindful of, uh, prayerful that we will be encouraged by the word of God. Proverbs chapter number two, verse one, we'll read down to verse number eight. It should be on the screen as well. Behind me, I'll be reading from the message translation. When you have it, say, I got it. Next six months or so with a lot of our young people and loved ones and family members there. And this past week, we uh, were back there for the second year anniversary. And I know there are a few of us from the church that went past the band, led a delegation, and, and uh, Wayne Clark and a few of our other uh, leaders from here, Anton Burrell, some of our stewards were there and uh, got a chance to ex examine and at least uh, experience a little bit of uh, what we had to really endure some two years ago. Uh, certainly, uh, I was shaken on my way to sleep last night as one of my good friends uh, that we met in Ferguson, who's from Milwaukee, uh, started to tweet me and text me and let me know that Milwaukee was on fire. And uh, it looked very much like Ferguson. Um, I was already in my mind thinking a lot about Baton Rouge and how the floods have, have come down there and, and totally uh, just really destroyed the community and one of the, the mothers and the elders that uh, we spend a lot of our work with, she mentored me in our organizing and justice work. You know, I was texting her and she was trying to evacuate her family, her, 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 her mother and other folks who uh, the flash floods came so quick. And, and then I was aware of the other tragedies that happened this week, several shootings in the Bay, another trans woman of color killed earlier this week. And and uh, the murders of uh, an imam and another parishioner in New York City. And I just tell you, you know, uh, I, 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 I'm trying to preach these sermons on lightening your load. And if you're like me, it seems like the load just keeps getting heavier. Uh, now, you know, if I were to poll all of you today, I bet you I, 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 I could probably find a few of you guys who had your own personal explosions this week in your life. You started off on Monday and you were filled with great expectation. I mean, we preached last week about the promises of God and how you got to keep counting. And I was counting all week long. But then, you know, you, you start to be reminded of all the trouble that you are surrounded by. I don't know about you, but uh, experience your own assaults on your body, assaults on your mind, on your soul, on your spirit. Maybe some violations in your family, some indiscretions that uh, you participated in that are continuing even to this day to cause you a little bit of angst and anxiety. I want you to continue to imagine, my brothers and sisters, as we conclude this series on lightening our load, that uh, we as a people are always uh, going to be, if we are truly awake and tuned in, to the kind of world in which we live, a fallen world, we are a people who are often characterized and overly aware of our human weakness and the evil and suffering in the world. Last week, I talked about how time can be a threat to the promises of God, particularly when you are someone who builds your whole life around a promise and then it takes too long to happen. And you start getting nervous because the clock be ticking and you like, man, this clock been ticking a long time. And time can be a threat to the promises of God. 
But today I also want to offer up that time could be a very powerful teacher. A teacher that shows you and I about how God moves, acts, and even is faithful. God can often use time, that which is often a threat to our promises uh, coming to pass because they're taking too long. God can use time as a container to collect the wisdom of human experience. God can use our ability to reflect on time and allow the reflection and the meditation that you and I are often called as people who live a historical faith. Because remember, your faith is not something that was just created yesterday in a test tube. Hello, somebody. Your faith is a historical faith, a faith that you are being welcomed into the story of God's activity in the world. And because you and I are a part of God's story in the world, how many of you know there's a lot of wisdom that is inherent in this story? That you and I have to take a little bit of initiative to mine and to pull into our everyday struggles, trials, and adversities. Time can become a container where God allows the wisdom of experience, human experience, to be intersecting with the divine knowledge of God. A knowledge that shows us how we can examine and embrace and prioritize the collection of wisdom that has been left to us over time. Make no mistake about it, I am one who believes that the more I get comfortable reflecting in time on the wisdom of God, the more I can exist throughout the course of time as I have to struggle with the challenges I deal with every day. Now, it's so important to have a important it's so important to have a critical conversation about time. Because often in this society, in this moment, many people choose to live ahistorically. Meaning, people like to live outside of time, as if time has no uh, 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 trajectory, if you will. I often, uh, when I'm speaking to folk who are always trying to figure out why are people so upset, I say, well, you know, people are upset because people are tired of getting toe up. Amen. It's not a mystery. It's not been one day in the history of this country where we as a people have not experienced arbitrary violence at the hands of the state. And some folk will say, well, it's because you commit crime. Well, what, what about during 1960, 65, when, you know, they was, you know, very respectable and in suits and marching nonviolently? Seemed like y'all still found a reason to unleash the, the power of the state upon folks' head, or what about the times when they were in, in, in Jim Crow or in slavery and the violence that was arbitrary? Not just on black folk, but on indigenous folk, on brown folk, on poor white folk, that at some moment in time, violence seems to be a tool of the empire of the state to maintain social order. So one question that you and I have to start asking ourselves is how do we not allow time to slide past us as we're trying to make sense of the present in which we live? Because one could argue that even the things you're going through right now, you could look back in time and make some, some, some clear connections. Hello, somebody. That could add up to help you figure out why you win the state you win. Jesus, how many know you just didn't pop up as a hot mess? Amen. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. There's a lot of time you put on that mess. I wish I could talk to somebody today. There's a, there's a lot of investment over time that have helped to turn us into whoever we've become today. And it's okay because I believe that as long as you are alive reckoning with time, 
then you have the opportunity for transformation and change. Hello, somebody. But when you're trying to live outside of time, then you're living in a fantasy land. And there ain't nothing like believing a beautiful lie. Amen. If I were you, I, I, I'd get rid of the beautiful lies and I'd try to start taking a look at the ugly truth. Because no matter how ugly the truth is, it is still the truth. And how many of you know the truth can set you free? In the biblical text, then, we find a very powerful gift that we have at our disposal when we think about the way in which God has allowed time as a container to collect wisdom. The wisdom uh, books and the wisdom literature in scripture is often given to us as a gift, not just for us to develop these kind of incontrovertible doctrines and, 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 and theologies, but they are also given to you and I as a guide. For all of us in the room who appreciate the school of hard knocks, amen, anybody been through that, got a couple degrees from that, amen, how many of you would have appreciated if the school of hard knocks had put out a manual? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so at least you only have maybe one hickey upside your head instead of 10. You still going to get a hickey now, please understand, because there ain't no way to go through life hickey free. But I would be grateful if there were some clear uh, collections of the wisdom of God through the experience of humanity that helped me to understand what is happening in the world. Wisdom literature in the biblical text is an important genre of scripture that you and I must pay just as much attention to as we do the Gospels, as we do the uh, letters from the apostles, as we do the prophets, as we do the, the, the narratives of, of the Hebrew scriptures, wisdom literature helps you and I appreciate that across time and across culture, there are wisdom principles that if you attain, you will have a more fruitful and flourishing and faithful life. And how many of you know, in a moment like this, when we're always trying to make sense of what's going on, I could use some more wisdom. Because there are competing wisdoms out here now. Hello, somebody. There are wisdoms that will be competing for your attention, for your uh, adherence, even for your ability to focus on. But I want to submit to you that if you are going to throw your lot into some wisdom, I would throw my lot into the wisdom of God that has been collected through time and experience of the people of God. Give your neighbor a high five and tell them, listen up to this wisdom. Listen up to this wisdom. Now, it's so important to appreciate that when we think of wisdom literature, particularly in the text we've written, I love how wisdom literature seems to always elevate understanding insight and knowledge wisdom literature seems to always want to drill down into understanding this idea that there is something going on that requires a little bit more reflection how I many of things ain't always what they seem to be on the surface amen it's lord i don't know if i'm just in the wrong church this morning you know things ain't what they always seem. And when you and I aren't willing to spend the time listening and reflecting to get an understanding of what's going on, you could have a same experience that everybody else is having, but your consciousness could be so dull that you you reflecting and you're narrating the whole situation in a way that is shallow rather than the depth it deserves. Insight. Insight helps you and I to appreciate what is behind what's going on. What are the root causes of what's going on? Knowledge helps you and I to apply the wisdom. Hear me now. Because it's not just enough for you to know wisdom and insight, but you can't apply it. So knowledge is the ability to apply that which you learn. 
How many, how many know folk who got a lot of book wisdom, but ain't got no knowledge? I'm trying to help somebody in here today. Amen. I'm going to leave y'all alone on that one. You see, I find this to be such an important practice for us, many of us, who are always trying to figure out why are things happening the way that they are. When we look at all the violence in the world and we see uh, the uh, potential rebellions that are happening not just here in the United States, but one of my uh, friends, when we were in Ferguson, it just came back from uh, her Palestine trip that I went on earlier this year, and it was so fascinating. She's from Ethiopia. She said that Ethiopia is having a rebellion. Folk all over the country, all over the world are seeming to rise up in a spirit of rebellion against some of these systems and powers. Now, you know, it requires a little bit of understanding, insight, and knowledge to really appreciate what's going on. Because you will look at the way it's reported in the news and feel like, boy, these old violent people, why don't they just cooperate? How many ever heard that before? Why don't they just cooperate? How many ever said that before? It's okay, we in church, you ain't got to lie, Craig. You <laughs> ain't got to lie. I was at my pastor's uh, 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 thing the other day. My pastor had his 55th anniversary or birthday, and one of the saints told me, oh, pastor, so good to see you, but, you know, just kind of pulled me to the side and was whispering, you know, because I think they didn't want, want the people who's tapping my phone to hear it. <laughs> pastor, when the police tell you to move, just move. Don't go to jail anymore. We don't need you in jail. And I said, oh, bless you. Now, ain't it something? I only been to jail once. It's, it's like Groundhog Day up in here or something, man. I, just, I only didn't move once. But it seems like my not moving is considered an act of violence to the system that shouldn't be telling me to move in the first place. And it's not, it's not a mystery, I think, for all of us to appreciate what Franz Fanon calls collective catharsis, right? This idea that in every society and every collectivity exists, there he says, must exist, a channel and an outlet through which the forces accumulated in the forms of aggression can be released, meaning that if you are the subject of aggression long enough, no matter what you think about it, as a human being, you will have a cathartic release. It's kind of like a volcano. You know, you, that volcano get to rumbling enough, ain't no talking to the volcano. <laughs> oh, volcano, you know how much damage you're going to do? You should really just, you know, chill out. That volcano going, you know, burn you up a little bit. <laughs> Isn't it interesting that while many of us would, would, would give ourselves the space to have our own cathartic releases, we would not afford that to anyone else. Knowing though that all of us are under a level of attack from the enemy. The enemy of your soul and the enemy of your body. See, wisdom helps you and I to be able to get an understanding about what's going on, have some insight about why it's happening, and then use some knowledge to apply the tools and the solutions to help us be able to lighten our load as we go through these seasons of aggression. And make no mistake about it, many of us experience cathartic releases in many different kinds of ways. Some of us come to church. You know, we grew up in the holiness, Pentecostal, apostolic, tongue-talking, foot-stomping, uh, swinging from the chandeliers church. Now I think we just a hand-clapping, a few tongue-talking, a few stomp. I don't see no swinging from the chandeliers, maybe because we don't have any. I don't know. We can put some in, though, if that'll help y'all to swing. <laughs> but how many of you know church for many of us has become a cathartic relief? People came to church and they cried and they wept and they hollered and they shouted because all throughout the week they had hell on their job, hell in their house, hell in their community. And they had to figure out a way to not give the hell back. 
so they'll come to church and give the hell to God. <laughs> oh, Jesus! And folks be like, oh my. And you know, some folk, good old Sadiddy, uppity, bougie folks sitting next to them, like, I don't know why they carry. <laughs> Until it was their turn. <laughs> Ooh, I'm telling you, everybody, somebody say everybody. Everybody will need a cathartic release. Some of us use uh, uh, food and shopping and capitalism and, 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 and economic uh, indulgence as a form of cathartic release. So, you know, we work hard for our money and we shop <laughs> literally until we drop. Why? Because the hell we had to go through to get that money. Had to sit on my job and listen to these people talk about my quality of work. Talk about my temperament. Talk about my three hour lunch breaks. <laughs> so you go shopping to get your cathartic release. But you also have some folk who don't have any other options but to use violence. As a form of their cathartic release. Why? Because they're living in a predatory environment. And how many know if you live in a predatory environment, you will become a predator? So when you are looking for the truth of why things are the way that they are, you and I have to not just dabble on the surface of how things will be reported in the media, how some of our simple-minded family members, friends, preachers, and even, you know, the hood wisdom will always give you and I a very shallow analysis of what's going on. We have to search the wisdom and the containers of time to help us make sense of what's going on. I believe Ferguson exposed the sinister nature of state violence. Milwaukee is exposing the failure to change these predatory environments. The trans woman being killed is exposing transphobia and homophobia and patriarchy. Several shootings in the Bay Area continue to expose the epidemic of violence and the impact of trauma. Baton Rouge is continuing to expose the vulnerability of poor people to all kinds of disasters, both human-made and naturally induced. The murders of the imam and the Muslim brother or sister, I can't remember exactly who, who the other person was, it's exposing the hatred and the Islamophobia that is run amok in our country right now. But the wisdom of God that we, a historical people grounded in faith, shown to us through Jesus Christ, reminds us that death, nor destruction, nor violence has the final say. The wisdom of God, captured through the life of Jesus, Reminds us that on the way to peace, it will be littered with violence. On the way to salvation, it will be littered with vulnerability. On the way to justice, it will have some struggle. But our place in this process, if you will, is to be peacemakers. Peacemakers with boldness with unapologetic commitments to justice and healing and wholeness. And I want to submit to you that when we listen to the wisdom of God, the wisdom of God gives you and I the tools and the pathway to inner peace, communal peace, and peace with God. And I want you to understand that to be a peacemaker Flowing from the wisdom of God is not just to be at peace with your brother or your sister, but it is to be at peace with yourself. It is to be at peace with God. It is to be at peace with God's creation. And in the midst of what's going on around us, I want to submit to you that the inquiry and the reflection necessary to hold on to this wisdom must be a part of every response that proves to be life-giving. So how can you and I then... Listen up for wisdom, appreciating that you will always have all kinds of wisdoms trying to get inside your brain. The first thing I'll say to you from the scriptures is you have to have a great filter. 
Somebody say, get a filter. Amen. Get a filter. The scripture says in verse number two, tune your ears to the world of wisdom. Tune your ears to the world of wisdom. What does that mean? That means, my brothers and sisters, that unless you train your ear, unless you tune in to the world of wisdom that's around you, you may find yourself susceptible to the foolishness that is also attempting to grab your attention. Tuning your ears to the world of wisdom helps you and I to appreciate that the inverse must also be true. That there is indeed foolishness out here that wants your attention. Foolishness that wants to inform the way in which you move and act in the world. That wisdom is not the only narrative, the only principles at work in your life, on your job, in your family, in your neighborhood, at your school, that you must have a filter that can, you know, reject the foolishness and hold on to the wisdom. Now, for many of us, this is hard because we spent most of our life tuning our ears to foolishness. How do you tune your ear to foolishness? When you listen, I'm going to mess up somebody, to artistic expressions that get you in the totally opposite place you say you want to be. Somebody say foolishness. When you watch with your eyes, the kind of images that stimulate your mind in a way that is unsustainable. So I say foolishness. When you read the kinds of materials that are not grounded in the historical faith that is life to us, more than you, you know, read all these other pieces of interesting material. <laughs> you know, isn't it fascinating that we're doing some work and we're trying to figure out how to reach millennials with information about all kinds of important things. We were like, okay, so maybe we should figure out what website uh, most of our folk are, 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 are like watching the most. And the website is World Star <laughs> Hip Hop. Now, what you think about this for a second? We are in the process of creating a marketing and politicization campaign, political education campaign, a values based campaign to put on World Star because that's the number one site visited by many of us. <laughs> I mean, no harm. Hello, somebody. How many know I'm not hating on World Star necessarily? But I was saying, if World Star is your filter, can you imagine the kind of Things you're going to end up allowing into your brain, into your decision making. Hello, somebody. C.S. Lewis, he says this so powerfully, and I love this. He says, every time you make a choice, you are turning the central part of you, the part of you that chooses, into something a little different than it was before. And taking your life as a whole with all of your innumerable choices all your life long, you are slowly turning the central thing into a heavenly creature or a hellish creature. Either a creature that is in harmony with God 
and with other creatures and with itself or else into a creature that is in a state of war and hatred with God and with his fellow creatures and with itself. To be one kind of creature is heaven, that is joy, peace, knowledge, and power. To be the other creature is madness, horror, idiocy, rage, impotence, and eternal loneliness. Listen to this. Each of us, at each moment, is progressing to one state or the other. Our filter is so important because if we allow too much foolishness into our being, it can grossly over-determine, mutate, pervert who God has created and intended for us to be as his people in the world. Wisdom, then, seeks to be a filter to help you stop as much of that stuff as possible. But you and I have to figure out a way to seek out this wisdom. So the first question that I'll lift up to you today, is wisdom your filter? Or what foolishness is tuning your ears to ignore this wisdom and understanding? Is wisdom your filter? Is wisdom the thing that you are using to kind of make sure some of these extra additives? <laughs> yes, Lord. This extra contaminants. When we were in Flint, Michigan, it was very clear that when things get poisoned and contaminated, if you don't have a strong enough filter, it don't matter what your intention is. That poison gets in your system. And it will tear you up from the inside out. Is wisdom your filter? How do you then get wisdom? The second thing that the scripture then will lift up is sometimes you and I have to practice silence. Somebody holler silence. 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 Psalm 62 verse 5, it says that my soul waits in silence for God. For my hope is from him. Sometimes, my brothers and sisters, we can't get access to the wisdom because we are not spending enough time in silence. Silence so you can hear God speak. Silence so you can meditate on the truths and the principles of God. If you like me, it's hard for me to be silent. Just be in a room and there be no silence. Amen. My girls, I, 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 was, I, was, I was so upset with them. They did, you know, my girls, they, they think they Mike Tyson and Evander Holyfield. About five minutes a day, they just feel like they got to bite ears off and pluck eyes out and punch one another. And I'm trying to figure out why, because I don't do that. Amen. I don't punch. I don't, no, I don't punch. I don't, I don't, I'm not a violent person. <laughs> so this last time I told them, what I want you to do is go sit there on the, the little fireplace area on your hands, close your eyes and just be silent. And you thought that I was torturing them girls. <laughs> oh, they started to squirm and start to cry. Ooh, I said, hey, <laughs> silence. I want silence in here. <laughs> Talking about a four-year-old and a six, seven-year-old can't sit there for five minutes in silence. We have trained ourselves to not be silent. We need music. We need the TV. We need background noise. We need all kind of things. Why? Because we can't be silent. But don't you know silence, practicing silence is a spiritual discipline? 
that you and I got to sometimes slow everything down and just say, I'm, going, I'm just going to sit here in some silence. And I'm just going to wait for God to say something to me. I'm going to wait for the wisdom of God that I have been mining and, 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 and pulling from to, 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 to uh, emerge from my consciousness, from my spirit. When I'm in a situation and I'm looking for some direction, Lord, help me to sit in silence and prayer. Help me to read your word and, and do the things that will actually awaken that which God has placed in me. Jesus was such a great example about this. Because how many of you know, listen, Jesus, when Jesus was on the earth, Jesus was never not around a crisis. Because Jesus, the fact that he was God in the flesh, Jesus was overly aware of the fallenness of humanity. Because nothing around Jesus was the way he created it to be. I'm sure Jesus walking around and looking at folk and like, what, what, what is this? Jesus seeing trees dying. What is this? <laughs> She's like, I didn't create this like this. Jesus, always surrounded by the awareness of the fallenness of the world. And yet, you and I never see Jesus not taking enough time to be silent. You and I never see Jesus just always running, running, running without pulling away from the crowds to seek out time with God. Think about this. Jesus living in a crisis space always found time to pull away from the crisis to go to a mountain to pray. <laughs> to move away from the crowds to pray. Some of us, we spend so much time in crisis, no wonder we can't access wisdom because we're not giving wisdom a chance to emerge. But could it be that sometimes you and I got to put a cone of silence around us? You know, an impenetrable cone. You and I have to build our spiritual disciplines up to a place when you need to get alone with God. You can hit that button. Boom. Your kids pulling on you, daddy, daddy. I don't hear nothing. <laughs> People on your job running you down on your nerves. Cone of silence. <laughs> Pookie and Shanae and cone of silence. Your bill collectors, your health. Cone of silence. Why? Because I'm trying to access the wisdom that only comes from God when I wait in silence. With all that's going on around us, my brothers and sisters, the church, if nothing else, needs to practice some seasons of silence. To hear, God, what would you have us to do? To be clear, a season ain't a permanent, because some of us, you know, we, we, just, we just silent all together. And we're not looking for God in silence. We just silent because we afraid, disinterested, no empathy. That's different than looking for God in silence. God is calling for some of us to enter into a season of silence so we can see God. And understand, my brothers and sisters, that sometimes in your active silence, you may find a gift where you can listen to wisdom. What noise then is threatening to clutter your ears is my question. What noise is cluttering your ears and invading your cone of silence, if you will? I remember in the uh, book of 1 Kings, I believe, Elijah was, was trying to find where God was because Elijah was experiencing all kinds of trouble and Jezebel and Ahab were on his tail. Elijah just done all these mighty exploits and, and, and helped defeat the gods of Ahab and Jezebel. And, 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 and Elijah was a little shook because they put a hit out on Elijah. 
And how many of you know when you do the right thing and you all of a sudden end up in the crosshairs of your enemy, sometimes your mind plays a little trick on you. Because we've been told to think if you do the right thing, then there ain't no trouble going to come your way. But how many of you know you can do the right thing and trouble will still come looking for you, knocking on your door? So Elijah was looking for God to answer him. And, and the angel of the Lord came to Elijah and he said, go and stand on the mountain before the Lord because God's getting ready to visit you today. And as Elijah went and stood on the mountain waiting for God, I'm sure, like many of us, we, Elijah thought that God was going to speak to him in a way that shook everything to its core. Because how many of you know when you're in a crisis situation and you being shook to your core, you want God to meet you at your shakenness? Amen. God, I'm reeling, so I need you to come on in here and do some reeling. But the scripture says that when, when, when God started to pass by, there was a great wind and the wind was so strong that it split the mountain and it broke the rocks into pieces. And Elijah's standing there like, that must be God. But the scripture says that the Lord was not in the wind. Elijah's standing there and then all of a sudden an earthquake happens and Elijah must have been like, oh, here comes my God coming to give me a good word. And the scripture says that the Lord was not in the earthquake. And then Elijah sees a fire come sweeping down from heaven. And I know Elijah went back in history and said, oh, I remember when God led the children of Israel through the desert with a fire. So come on, God, and speak to me. But the scripture says that the Lord was not in the fire. You see, sometimes we can have in our mind a preconceived notion of how God is going to speak and how God is going to show up and how God is going to enlighten and illuminate us. But how many of you know God ain't always going to come in an earthquake? And God's not always going to come in a wind that splits mountains and breaks rocks. And God's not always going to come in a scorching fire. But the scripture says that Elijah heard the sound of sheer silence. And the Lord was in the silence. Uh, and the scripture says Elijah wrapped his face and he moved himself into the center of this cone of silence so he could hear God. I'm here to tell you some of us need to do a practice of wrapping ourselves in a silence so we can hear from God. Because if you can't hear from God, you won't have what you need. In order to make it through these trials that are coming your way. If you can search out the good things that God is doing and the ways that God is speaking, you will find wisdom. And that's my last point. Somebody holler, search for wisdom. Verse number five says, search out wisdom like a prospector looking for gold. And, and I'm here to tell you that the wisdom that you and I need must be searched for like it is gold. Uh, like it is precious and, and like it has the ability to give you a gift that will keep on giving. Some of us don't appreciate that wisdom when you grab a hold to it will never lose its value. You can take my health away from me, but you can't take the wisdom. You can take my money away, but you can't take this wisdom. You can take the cars and the houses. My friends can walk away. Yeah. But when I have the wisdom of God that has been handed down to me because of the time and the faithfulness of God to the church and to his creation, then I believe that no weapon that comes my way will be able to trump the wisdom wisdom of God that has been revealed to me through the faithfulness of my God. Somebody holler search for wisdom. You have to realize that in your searching for wisdom, you got to engage in some practices uh, while you wait for the wisdom to be found. Uh, I appreciate in Philippians where it says rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Do not worry about anything. Lord, have mercy. Yeah. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, uh, let your thanksgiving uh, and your request be made known to God. Uh, and the peace that passes all understanding.
understanding shall guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So finally, beloved, whatsoever is true and whatsoever is honorable, whatsoever is just and pure, whatsoever is pleasing and commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, Think about these things. Uh, why? Because if you can think about the things that are worthy of God's acknowledgement and worship and praise, you will have the footsteps you need in order to walk into the best that God has for you. Uh, sometimes this moment in time can shake us and cause us to rely on the old wisdom that got you in the mess in the first place. Uh, but I want to tell somebody, you are to throw that wisdom out uh, and start to reach for the wisdom of reach for the wisdom of God uh, give your neighbor a high five and tell him reach for the wisdom of God uh, you ought to search for that wisdom uh, you ought to spend every moment you can looking for that wisdom uh, you ought to spend time around people who have that wisdom uh, you ought to read books that can show you that wisdom uh, you ought to watch shows that can reveal that wisdom uh, you ought to go to classes that can teach you that wisdom you ought to spend time in a bible study that can show you that wisdom you ought to spend time around people who are living out that wisdom because when you get around that wisdom that wisdom has a way of of penetrating uh, even your toughest heart and your mind uh, that wisdom has a way of rewiring that messed up thinking uh, that stinky thinking uh, that depraved thinking uh, that messed up uh, thinking that got you in the mess you in right now uh, that thinking that tells you you ought to return evil for evil uh, that wisdom that tells you you ought to return violence for violence uh, that wisdom that tells you that you you gonna lose uh, you ought to get access to some new wisdom uh, the wisdom that reminds you that God is on your side the wisdom that reminds you that you are more than a conqueror uh, the wisdom that reminds you that you are a winner in God uh, that wisdom that reminds you that the Lord is my light uh, and my salvation uh, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came upon me to eat up my flesh, this wisdom says they stumbled and fell. Though a war rise up against me, my heart will not fear because I know that I can be confident. One thing that I desired from the Lord uh, that will I seek after uh, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord uh, to behold his beauty uh, and to inquire in his temple what are you saying Pastor Mike uh, I'm saying that if I got a question uh, and I'm looking for some wisdom uh, what better place to get the wisdom I need uh, than being in the place where God is uh, because he is the one uh, that gives wisdom to those who ask uh, he is the one uh, who gives wisdom to those who seek uh, he is the one uh, who can give you the wisdom that you need you ought to tell Pookie I don't need your wisdom today you ought to tell your girlfriend I've had enough of your wisdom you ought to tell the streets tell the government tell the university tell the culture I've had enough of your wisdom but I I'm looking for the wisdom of God Shout hallelujah. I'm looking for the wisdom of God that will make my right road, that will make my crooked straight, that will exalt every valley, that will bring down every mountain, that will heal the sick, that will raise the dead, that will restore the mind. I'm looking for the wisdom of God. Say it.
But you got to look for it. You got to search it out. You got to search it out above all things. This wisdom that is contained in time, that's captured in scripture, that is communicated by God through his spirit, that is affirmed and demonstrated in the world. This wisdom is the most superior wisdom we can get. This wisdom will lighten your load. This wisdom will help you shed some burdens. This wisdom will help you relieve some of this pressure that is being heaped upon us. This wisdom will help you realize that you are not the problem. That we are not the problem. But that we serve a God who can handle the problem. This wisdom. This wisdom is a wisdom that we all have access to. The scripture says, if any of you lack wisdom, let them ask. Come on, stand with me. Lift those, those hands and let's take a few moments and let's ask. Let's ask God for some wisdom. Why? Because this God we can ask gives liberally, generously, and does not hold back. This wisdom will get you from A to B without having you go all the way to Z first. This wisdom will redirect all of your pain and struggle, make it redemptive, help you to see that you can't and won't be defined by the worst trouble in your life, but this wisdom will give you a sense of wholeness and victory and power. This wisdom will help you see and know that even with all the trouble happening in the world, God has not forgotten about us. Lift up those hands if you will.